The object is to look at how rapidly and how extensively Indonesia could convert from basically coal through to renewables, which basically means wind and solar photovoltaics. The conclusion, in summary, is that this is the way that Indonesia will definitely go, and the reason for that is that wind and PV are now cheaper than coal, and as well as having all the environmental advantages of low emissions. And uh, the conclusion was that Indonesia uh, could move rapidly to 100% renewable energy with the support of pumped hydro and uh, high voltage DC interconnections across the country and perhaps to Australia as well. PV and Indonesia go very well together. Uh, it's a tropical country. It has uh, very good sunshine across the year. It does not have a winter season, which is the case with all countries that are further away from the equator than Indonesia is. This means that you don't get the winter shortfall that happens with solar in higher latitude countries. Um, because PV is a fantastic technology for distributed energy, it means that PV can go on rooftops all over the country, it can go where people live, it's not centralised, though it can be, um, and you can put 50 megawatts or 50 kilowatts or 50 watts in a particular spot depending on what is actually required. So uh, it's a scalable, human-sized technology that is, uh, for a host of reasons, the world's number one new generation technology installed each year. PV in Indonesia is almost non-existent. Um, China, India and Indonesia are the big three developing countries in Asia. And uh, China has switched decisively to wind and PV and with some assistance from hydro. So something like 70% or more of new generation capacity in China is wind, PV and hydro. India, India is now on the cusp of switching um, to wind and PV. And Indonesia looks like for various reasons to be a few years behind. Although its potential is actually greater in relative terms than India or China because it is an equatorial country without a winter season. I would hope that Indonesia will make a very rapid move so that by 2030 much more than half of new generation capacity going in is in fact PV and by 2040 virtually all new generation capacity is PV. I think pretty much the whole world will go that way apart from the high latitude northern countries for which wind energy will be available. So pumped hydro is simply to have two reservoirs close together but separated by three, four, five hundred metres of altitude with a pipe between the two reservoirs and a pump and a turbine at the bottom of that pipe and when there's excess solar or wind electricity then water is pumped from the lower to the upper reservoir and when you want to recover that, res that energy it come, the water comes back down through the pipe through the turbine to recreate the electricity. So Indonesia is not short of mountains uh, almost everywhere where people live are very large numbers of mountains, volcanoes with very large heads, that's the height difference between the upper and lower reservoir, and a big head for pumped hydro is a very uh, favourable thing because it reduces costs. So unlimited opportunity and uh, the difference between on-river and off-river pumped hydro is that um, most land throughout the world is not near a river, but you don't need a river to run pumped hydro in a closed system where the same water simply shuttles backwards and forwards between the upper and lower reservoirs. In Australia we found about 20,000 pumped hydro sites and at a first guess in Indonesia we would find at least that many and possibly a good deal more. Indonesia has a lot of mountains per square kilometre of land uh, and so it really has got very favourable potential opportunities for off-river pumped hydro. So roughly speaking, the top 0.1% of the sites we found are all that would ever need to be developed. That means we can be extremely choosy to pick the best sites and I would anticipate that exactly the same thing will happen in Indonesia. Just the very best, most favourable sites will be needed to stabilise an Indonesian grid that has very high levels of wind and solar photovoltaics. Within individual households, um, most electrical supply is alternating current and um, that's universal for low and medium and short range high voltage transmission. But if you go beyond about seven or eight hundred kilometres of distance for transmission then you need to switch to DC for uh, physical reasons and um, high voltage DC cables operate at anywhere between 500 and a thousand 
kilovolts, so up, up around a megavolt, and um, really big systems are now being built that can transmit 12 gigawatts over 3,000 kilometres um, with a loss of 10%. In other words, you could move power from one side of Indonesia to the other and only lose about 10%. And these are aluminium cables about 10, 5 or 10 centimetres in diameter up on high towers or under seas in the case of uh, Indonesia for the island hopping required. And um, you can transmit very large amounts of, of power and that means that when the weather is poor, for example, in Java, but favourable in the eastern provinces, then you could move solar and wind power from the east to the west. And when the weather system moves from the west to the east, the power goes the other way. And the larger the area that you integrate with a high voltage DC cable, the less storage you need because the less likelihood there is that you'll have no power of alloy anywhere in the grid. I think a delegation from Indonesia to China and Australia would be very good and a couple of other countries where wind and PV are decisively winning the race for new generation capacity. The steps that could be taken within Indonesia are firstly to strongly encourage the beginnings of a rooftop solar photovoltaic industry because the skills that you acquire putting thousands and then millions of panels on roofs are directly transferable for large ground mounted systems. Um, then contracts for difference are a very effective way to encourage large ground mounted wind and PV systems and here the government basically sets a strike price, the company that bids the lowest price for supply of PV will be paid uh, a subsidy if the, gener if the market price falls below and will pay to the government if the market price goes above. And in this way, you have a guaranteed rate of return for the PV or wind system. This has been very effective in introducing large quantities of solar and wind into uh, grid systems all around the world, notably in India now, but also in China and other countries. There's a lot of experience that's being gathered around the world. It works extremely well and the fact that PV systems can be installed in 18 months from first concept to turnkey ready to go means that uh, this experience can rapidly be implemented in Indonesia.